and a half to make mm -hmm. before this. Wendy Skinner is a fiscal year 2014 recipient of an artist initiative grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board. This activity is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board thanks to the legislative appropriation of the Minnesota State Legislature by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. And that's you, the taxpayer, so thank you. Yay, arts! <laughs> So this past year, I spent weeks conducting research, and this means wandering around the area, interviewing dozens of people in Orr, Cook, Ely, and the surrounding area to get a feel for the landscape, and learn how wolves and the legislation of wolf hunting affect the residents in northern Minnesota. So why wolves, and why here? Well, I grew up to appreciate the outdoors on annual family camping trips to the Rockies, the Boundary Waters, and as a teenager and young adult, I spent three summers working for the Minnesota Youth Conservation Corps. And during this time, my connection to the land deepened. <coughs> I worked on state lands from northern Minnesota in Park Rapids, from Park Rapids to Brainerd to Baudette to Silver Bay and every place in between. One day a week, we learned about environmental issues, including hunting and the wolves, which at that time were an endangered species. So my fellow campers came from every corner of the state of Minnesota. They came from the River Falls, to Harbors, Worthington, Minneapolis, and our experiences and opinions about wolves and hunting differed as much as our hometowns did. My best camp girlfriend adored animals, including wolves, and she raised horses near a tiny town near Rochester, far removed from wolves. And my camp boyfriend, on the other hand, lived in Hoyt Lakes and had admitted to shooting a wolf with no apologies. But I loved them both. Now 30 some year, years later, here I am back in the woods and the lakes where I worked as a teenager far, and talking to people again, listening to your stories and your opinions about wolves and here's an excerpt in my journal after my first week here, which was in January of this year, when it rarely got above 10 degrees below zero. <laughs> and this is what it felt like. Oh my, what a trip. What a wealth of information, experiences, and emotion, from doubt to encouragement, fear, dread, anticipation, surprise, thrill, relief, frustration, exhaustion, compassion, disdain, and as they say, the greatest of all, love. I've discovered some people who have the biggest, tenderest hearts, and still others who, whose hearts have been broken or beaten and have formed a tough outer shell for protection. And still others who I never care to see again personally, but who challenge me greatly to see the deeper meaning of the human experience. This whole week has been a real exercise in human compassion. Is this what it feels like to be a missionary or something? Always turned on, facing, speaking face to face and searching for the needs of each soul I encounter? No matter who they are, how poorly or how well they treated me, my job is to find their motivation. What makes them who they are and discover that spark that could lead to a flaming success of a story. So what did I discover? I began with the idea to write stories about wolves and their, how their hunting have affected people here, but I also wanted to dispel stereotypes, go beyond what I'd seen in the popular media, newspaper, televisions, the internet, so I chose the personal interview, the most intimate primary source available as my way of gathering material in which to dispel those stereotypes. And I chose to write a collection of short stories because in the words of Nigerian writer and author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, the single story creates stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. That when we reject the single story, when we realize there's never a single story about any place, we regain a kind of paradise. So after months of processing my work, my stories have really bloomed into so much more than just 
stories about wolves and how their hunting have affected people. I've discovered that people don't only hunt wolves or avoid hunting wolves. They also look to wolves as a key to their cultural identity. They study them for the important role they play in our ecosystem. They project their greatest fears or hopes onto wolves. And depending on their unique personal experiences with wolves, people develop a visceral hatred of them or a deep affinity with them or someplace in between. So where do my characters live? They live in Greenstone, Minnesota, a fictitious <laughs> town situated on the edge of the Boundary Water Area Canoe Wilderness in the heart of Wolf Territory, and it looks eerily similar to Ely. <laughs> but remember, this is fiction. This is all in my head. <laughs> <laughs> this happens to be on one of my business cards, so if you got one of those, you're lucky, because this is like my favorite one. So what unites the characters in Greenstone, Minnesota? No, who are these characters? Let's visit that first. Well, here are some of those characters. They're people just like your friend living on the Fernberg, your neighbor working in town on Sheridan your cousin fishing on Fall Lake, or maybe they're just like you, a museum director, an Irish woman, a lake resort owner, a young trapper, an old trapper and his wife, an intern, a community college student, a bait shop owner. This has got to be my favorite picture of all time here, guys. <laughs> a wolf deer biologist, a wolf educator, a goat breeder, telemetry students, a dog sled guide, a naturalist, environmental activist, a veterinarian, <laughs> mining advocates. Don't you like that picture, guys? An artist, an outfitter, who happens to drive a red Volkswagen convertible, a conservation officer, a dog lover, even a roller girl or two or three. So what happens to characters in Greenstone? Trouble, that's what. A wolf biologist receives a threat from an Arizona anti-wolf terrorist, and the letter is postmarked Greenstone. A gun-toting woman and her dogs go on their nightly patrol with deadly consequences. A man leads his niece on snowshoes for miles into the wilderness to evade child protection services. A Korean War veteran relives his past transgressions when his teenage granddaughter comes to live with him. A conservation officer investigates a trespassing complaint. Instead, he finds a wolf and a woman who stirs memories of his violent past and a dangerous desire to love again. What unites these characters? The winter landscape of snow and ice, biting wind, piercing blue sky, starlit nights, and the occasional black wolf 
the elusive black wolf that makes an occasional appearance in almost every story, if not every story. They search for understanding and justice and love in a world marked by solitude and the unpredictable wilderness within their own hearts. 